doctor and told them what we were doing, they gave us some great deals. <laughs> so the money actually went a lot <laughs> further than it did. Yeah, it's always good. Yeah, that was the art teacher that was. And that's an important part of my life. Yeah, so that's what I You know, I've had, I'm a counselor there, and I've had students, you know, say that they feel invisible and things like that. So it's, it was a big deal to us to you know, try to do it. Yeah, that's what it looked like. Yeah, that's what it looked like. I want to thank you all for coming to our fourth annual Innovation and in Education Breakfast. My name is Stephanie Gangopoulos, and I am the chair of the Sioux Falls Public Schools Education Foundation Board. And um, I wanted to take a moment this morning to um, thank our sponsors of our breakfast, um, which is First Premier and Premier Bank Card, SDN Communications, and the First National Bank in Sioux Falls. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our board members. Um, we do not have an executive director, and so we are truly a working board, and our board members invest a lot of time. And so I would like our board members to stand, as well as Rob Swenson, who handles our media, and Angie Kuiper, who is our foundation coordinator. Would you all please stand and be recognized? Thank you all so much for everything you do for the foundation each and every day. I know that all of you in this room share our passion for education, whether you're a donor, an educator, a business leader, um, a community leader, and so I want to thank you all so much for being here this morning to learn more about the Education Foundation and the programs that we provide. Um, hopefully you had a chance this morning to talk to some of our grant recipients. They were located around, the, had tables around the room this morning. Um, if you didn't, a lot of them will be available after the breakfast as well. Um, so that you have a chance to go around and learn about what they'll be implementing in their classroom this next year. Um, this morning we're going to also hear from a couple of our grant recipients, and so that will be fun um, to hear about what they're planning to, to implement. As well, um, we'll also hear from our superintendent, Dr. Maher, and he's going to be updating us on the priorities for the, the school district for this upcoming year. Um, but first, I would like to visit a little bit about, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Education Foundation, a little bit about our programs, um, we, and our mission. So our mission um, is to um, enhance the educational opportunities and promote academic achievement among students by supporting academic projects and activities not funded by tax dollars. And we do this mainly through grant programs to teachers. And we have two uh, primary grant programs. Our first is Beyond Books, and the second is um, Innovation in Education. Our Beyond Books grant program um, supports first year, first time teachers that have no classroom experience. And first year teachers, um, they come into the classroom and they have to buy and, and, and supply their classroom with all sorts of things. And the costs are substantial. Uh, many teachers estimate that they spend around $1,000 setting up their first classroom, uh, which is a lot of money. And so um, these startup costs are necessary but typically aren't covered in school budgets. And so the foundation provides grants each year to first-time teachers with zero classroom experience. Um, in 2016, we uh, get, gave out about 60 grants. And next week at new teacher orientation, we're anticipating giving out 57 grants. Um, in the past, uh, those grants have been in the $100 range. We'd love to get it up to $1,000 someday, um, but we've, we've started off uh, with $100. We also have our Innovation and in Education Grants Program, and this has been in place since 2008. And the goal of the Innovation and in Education Grants Program is to help teachers apply advanced technology and innovative curriculum uh, additions to their lesson plans. 
And since 2008, we have um, awarded 265 grants, totaling more than $300,000. And these grant proceeds are used to purchase school um, materials that, uh, and curriculum. And often these materials are used year after year, so the actual number of students impacted by these grants just continues to multiply each year. The, the grant process for, the, for this is it's a competitive process, so we receive grant applications in from teachers and um, electronically, and then the names of the teacher as well as the school are removed from the grants and before they're forwarded on to our grants committee. And our grants committee is comprised of um, former educators as well as business and community leaders. And they use a rubric to, um, to score the grants. And it's really quite an honor to be chosen for one of our grants. Um, last year, we were only able to fund 37% of our grant requests. And so we funded a total of $40,000 worth of grants. Um, this morning, we have two grant recipients uh, that received grants last spring. And they're here to explain a little bit about the new programs that they plan to implement. And so I'd like to invite Nathan Hofflander from Roosevelt High School and Jason Whiting from Patrick Henry Middle School to come forward and tell a little bit about their grants. Good morning, my name is Nathan Hofflander. I'm a computer science teacher at Roosevelt High School. Uh, I'm a digital architect, computational thinker, and uh, loyal trooper to uh, education, along with Jason. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, Jason and I are both in uh, uh, technology, computer science, and uh, at middle school and high school. So um, what I would first like to start with is uh, just, just thanking everyone uh, for sponsoring all of our projects through the uh, Sioux Falls Education Foundation. Um, we, we, you know, would have a very difficult time doing this without you guys. So uh, we do thank you so much. And uh, especially uh, thank you for uh, innovation and education for the Valari program at Roosevelt. Uh, Valari means to fly in Latin. And I think I have our site up here. Um, the Valari project is, uh, is integrating drones into education. So any teacher in any classroom should be able to uh, come to us, check out a drone for use in the classroom to support a lesson, um, to reinforce content uh, and those kinds of things. Um, students could also use them uh, to um, use in like a class project or something like that. Uh, but really uh, exposing students to science, technology, engineering, and math in any subject is, uh, is part of our main goal. Um, our classroom examples, if you uh, go to classroom examples, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of fast forward a little bit. Uh, I've created a website in, in, uh, in addition to uh, our funding and the vision for what the Volari program is. is this is scalable. Uh, it's not available for just one high school. This is actually available uh, for many high schools. I've created a framework that would allow uh, teachers in different schools, different districts, high schools across our, our, sit, our state um, and, and more uh, to be able to, to start a drone program in a way that um, really all that they, that, that they need to do is find some funding. And, uh, and you guys made that possible for us. Um, <clears throat> our resulting equipment uh, from our, our sponsorship, if you go to the fleet at RHS, uh, just to show you what we have purchased uh, some of these we, we had, but we had to uh, uh, make sure that we reinforced our fleet with some good training drones, and one and two is gonna be our training drones. I brought the Mambo here today, and I'll have a, a short demonstration of that here shortly. And, uh, oops, it's durability. <laughs> the example of durability. That's why it's the training drone. Strategically drugs. chosen for just that purpose. Uh, we also got some higher end drones. The secondary goal was to get um, students involved with real world activities, uh, something that would um, help them see that um, there are many uses for drones out there, for drone services, for companies and, and businesses like your own. 
Um, so to, to uh, bring a program to uh, the high school level and get them some real world experience is, uh, is what we're all about. So if you scroll down, just going to show you what we did at the end of our school year. Uh, if you click on the isosceles right there, and I've got an example of the brochure that we uh, gave all of our spectators that came out. We had a drone race at the end of the school year. We had student teams and teacher teams uh, competing for the, for the gold at isosceles. The drone race, uh, it was in the shape of an isosceles triangle. Uh, we had connected LED lights to uh, light up our course so we knew where to go. Um, and after a few weeks of safety training and practice, uh, we got these guys out uh, to fly these mini drones and it was just it was just a lot of fun and it's something that we want to do uh, more in the future. Um, from the Volare project, project uh, we also formed a student club called the RHS Flight Club and the RHS Flight Club uh, basically how we see this happening is Volare brings the equipment and the idea the vision uh, of drones in the classroom whereas, whereas our student club is going to be the ones that are in charge of the events. So we would like to have two events uh, every school year and if we get it into other, into other high schools uh, we can start competing and start hosting drone races at the end of the school year. So you can see that they uh, had a lot of fun. Not everybody won. But we're, we're all winners if we can get a drone in the sky, right? And not crash it too much. Uh, a couple of our other drones we're able to program, so we bring that into, uh, into our classes, our AP Computer Science and uh, Exploring Computer Science classes. Um, this all couldn't be possible without you guys. and. Um, the site, if you wanted to uh, easily get there, easy to remember, sufudrones.com. If you go sufudrones.com, uh, this will take you directly to our project site, and, uh, and you can see more information there. So there's tons of information packed here, uh, packed into this website um, for teachers, parents, administrators, uh, district leaders, and, uh, and also for, for business leaders like yourselves. Um, so our next event uh, is in so many days, better start planning. <laughs> um, if we can go down to uh, just go to uh, request drone services, that last. And then if you scroll down, there should be a link at the bottom for impact. So here's, here's kind of a uh, we're impacting and if you scroll further go outside organizations uh, great opportunity for a partnership between um, your businesses and the Sioux Falls School District um, we could possibly provide services for you and if you just play that this is where we'll end and you can just take it from here So if you can imagine your own your own business getting some getting some uh, exactly. getting some footage of the uh, outside area, you could attract new employees. Um, you could promote a new product. Uh, lots of great opportunities, and uh, it's not just about um, entertainment. It's also about inspections, surveys um, for law enforcement, um, emergency services. Uh, you've got different types of cameras that on your higher end drones, thermographic cameras can uh, spot on a building uh, where it's hottest so we could vent a house and possibly save lives inside of a, a burning building. Um, so this is just one of many services. Um, just one more. Now with this and uh, in your continued sponsorship for grants like these uh, through the Sioux Falls Education Foundation, uh, it proves that your support is valuable and, uh, and your commitment shows great commitment to our community and to uh, education. So thank you so much for supporting us and uh, going through the Sioux Falls Education Foundation.
All right, can you hear me without the mic? I feel like I'm loud enough. I'll still use it a little bit. Okay, my name is Jason Whiting. I am a middle school, uh, Patrick Henry Middle School ICT teacher. Um, for those of you who don't know what ICT is, it used to be the typing class. Now we're more, so it doesn't stand for I can type anymore. Um, <laughs> Uh, two years ago, this is, we're going to our third year of a new curriculum, uh, and our new curriculum is based on being a responsible digital citizen, um, and so we're teaching our 6th, 7th, and 8th graders how to be responsible in this digital world that they live in. Um, I was, prior to Patrick Henry, I was an elementary teacher at Hayward Elementary, and the first year that we um, had our Chromebooks rolled into our rooms and said you get to have one-on-one -on -one devices, um, the computer techie geek inside of me got really excited. Uh, I have a master's in instructional technology and leadership, so I had been, had two years of training on how to um, integrate technology into a curriculum, into an everyday um, classroom. So when I moved up to middle school we, and, and I got to teach this computer science stuff, I got really excited. I've been writing a grant. This was my sixth or seventh attempt to get him. Um, and this is Currently, his name is Fred because my four-year-old daughter, when he came out of the box, said, oh, he looks like a Fred. <laughs> so we're going with Fred until my students rename him. Um, then, and my, my idea is that my students every year are gonna give him a new name. So in eight years, he's gonna be like Bob, Joe, Frank, whatever. And they're just gonna keep adding on just to kinda keep the ownership for the students that named him each year so that they're always part of him. Um, so here's what, here's what Fred does. Fred is a humanoid robot that is 100% programmable. And I, I started a coding club at Patrick Henry two years ago when I started there. And um, I, I believe in the power of computer programming in the educational world. All right, when, you, when you hear computer programming, the most common thing I get is, oh, I don't know, I don't understand that stuff, I'm not good with computers. Well, the benefits of computer programming are simple and they, they affect every part of education. There's critical thinking and problem solving. All right, so what a computer programmer does, if those of you that are in here, if you are in that field, you know, the programmer is given a problem and they have to write the code to solve that problem. Okay, so what I wanted to do with, with Fred um, is we have at Patrick Henry, we have a RISE program. We have a special ed department that um, they have their own curriculum we have uh, quite a few students who are on the autism spectrum and this robot has its own software package that is geared just towards autis autistic students. Um, but on top of that, I went to my, my special ed teachers and I said, okay, so if I write this grant and I get it, this is what I would like to do. I would like to partner with you and I would like you to tell me what you would like your students to learn. It's, and it could be anything. Um, you know, some of their students are learning um, colors and body parts and things like that. So my, my students can program him so that, see when I touch him, he's interactive. Like right now he's trying to find my face because we have face recognition. Um, and he'll, every now and then he'll say, pay attention to me because I, I forget about him. Um, <laughs> but he's, he's definitely got a personality. Um, but what we will do is we, my student will program it so the, the SPED teachers will tell me, this is what we want to have done. I will present that problem to my students, my sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students, and my coding club, club students. And I'll say, this is what we need to have it programmed to do, go. And they will have everywhere from, if you're familiar with computer programming, um, what's being used in the educational world is what's called drag and drop. So it's got commands called stand, and they drag it to this workspace on their computer, plug it into the, into the um, program, and they hit run, and he would stand up. Okay. All the way up to, there are seven different pro computer programming languages that he, we can write programs in. Python, JavaScript, um, C++, and, and five other ones. Okay. And so I'm gonna have students who actually are writing the lines of code themselves. Even in the drag and drop, they have to open up the box and manipulate the lines of code on how to, what to make him say. So they're physically in the code, um, learning uh, all the different 
intricacies that go between the different languages because they're all different. It's just like speaking um, between English and Spanish. Which, by the way, he speaks 14 different languages. Um, and he, I know that his Spanish is good. My boys are in the, at Sonia Sotomayor in the Spanish Immersion Program. And so I had him say, hello, my name is Fred. Um, I would like to go for a walk in the park in Spanish. I didn't tell my boys. And they said, oh yeah, his name's Fred. He wants to go for a walk in the park. And he said in, in perfect accent in Spanish. So um, I haven't, honestly, my goal is for my students to teach me how to use him. So after this, if you want to come back, I got him set up to do a little Tai Chi and say hello to you and do some things like that. But it's very basic because I'm going to turn him over to my students and say, this is what we need to have done. Here's the program. Let's figure this out. And I can have 30 students working on 30 different programs and we can send them to him individually. All right, so, and if I teach six different periods of 30 students every day, that's, I mean, how many students is that a day? For those of you, I know it's early for math. <laughs> and actually, I could ask him if I hadn't programmed it, he could tell us the answer to that math program, or that math problem. But, um, so we're gonna be using him with students in Patrick Henry. Um, I'm gonna also, I have it, a, I've been talking to my principal, and we're gonna work it out so that I can take him to elementary schools and work with early childhood. Um, I'm gonna send him out to Roosevelt and let Nathan and his students work with him so that I can be in the drone, drone racing league. Um, <laughs> actually, some of my boys who watch drone racing league can do it, even though they're gonna be patriots, they wanna be riders because of that program. Um, so hopefully by the time they get to high school, it's at Lincoln, but. Um, so he's gonna not just be a Patrick Henry and make an impact with them. He's gonna be all over the school district. And I, don't have any background. I am not a computer programmer. I've taken one class. I didn't do very well in it. So it, for, the fact that I can use him means anybody can use him. All right, my wife is not. She is not a tech person. Her iPhone frustrates her, okay? But she could use this. Um, so Nathan's gonna take it, he's gonna use it. Nathan's got a computer science background. But I could, I could give this to an elementary school teacher with the program, and they could use it with their students. All right. Um, now, Fred is top of the line. He is, he's the best one on the market right now. So I figured if I was gonna do this, I was gonna do it right. Um, Fred can fall and pick himself back up. Um, he looks like he's fragile, but he's not. He can object recognize. I can tell him, to, if I show him, teach him what a red ball looks like, and he touches it, and his hands are tactile, um, I could send him to find the red ball in the room and he would go until he found it. He'd bump into things and back up and say, oops, sorry, um, or I'm tired, and then he'll just sit down and let his motors cool off. So, um, but the, without this, this group and this education foundation, I was 0 for 6 on getting this. And I shot for the moon. And it's because of this organization that my students and all the students that are gonna get to interact with him um, are getting this opportunity. So, um, very grateful. See, he's looking at me right now. He, uh, he's going to make a major impact. And his software updates automatically, so I don't have to purchase any new software. <coughs> so he's, it's part of the program. If there's new, it just downloads itself. So I never have to buy something new. All I have to do is take care of him. And my students, have been so excited about him that like, I've had students email me this summer, is he here, can we come play with him? Um, very, very happy. So um, on behalf of myself and every student that he's gonna impact, I, I cannot thank you enough. I, same from Nathan, what Nathan was saying, it's because of, of your generosity that we get this opportunity. And um, I hope that you have kids and grandkids and nieces and nephews that get to hear about him and hopefully there end up being more of him eventually. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Our goal is to continue to find ways to grow our grants program, both of our grants program each year, because we have a lot of needs in our district. 
And so therefore, we're constantly looking for new community partners um, to help us meet those growing needs. And so at this time, I'd like to recognize a couple of new substantial donors that came on board this past year. Um, the first organization is the Independent Insurance Agents in Sioux Falls, and they donated $10,000 for our Innovation and Education Grants program this past year, um, which, which was great. It really allowed us to uh, maintain our record um, giving level of our grants. And so I know Sheldon's here, and I'm not sure if there are any other representatives from, from that agency, but if you would all stand so that we could recognize you at this time. We also have an exciting announcement um, from the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution Foundation. And so at this time, I'd like to invite Bert Olson forward to present. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. I am president of the DAR Foundation, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit about our organization. The Mary Chilton DAR Foundation provides grants for projects in the Sioux Falls area and throughout South Dakota relating to the goals and ideals of the National Society, National Society Daughters of the American Revolution. This society was founded by women who had ancestors who fought in the American Revolutionary War in 1890 and purposes include funding historic, educational, and patriotic projects. The Sioux Falls Mary Chilton chapter was founded over 100 years ago, and the foundation has awarded grants for 30 years. Our board is made up of chapter members who have ancestors and a few men from the community like me. Earlier this year, our foundation board received an outstanding grant application from your foundation, and the grant was, was approved. So at this time, I am pleased to present to Stephanie a check in the amount of $15,000 to be used as a and, and Stephanie will share with you how the funds are going to be used. Thank you, uh, we, we were thrilled uh, to receive news that we were going to receive this, this grant this morning. And uh, with this money, we plan to double our Beyond Books grants to new teachers. So next week, when we present our grants to new teachers, instead of giving each new teacher $100 to help defray the cost of setting up their first classroom, we will be giving them $200. And then the remainder of the money will be used for the Innovation and Education Grants Program. So thank you so much to the GAL Foundation Board. I know that we have several members um, from that board in the audience today. Would you all please stand? They're scattered around the room. Thank you all so much. I also want to highlight um, our event, um, our, our teacher swap meet event um, that we had. And this is an event where teachers um, can buy, sell, and trade school supplies. And so we held our second annual teacher swap meet in June of this year. And the event just continues to grow. We, see, we hear a lot of positive comments from attendees. And we had about 80 tables of supplies um, that, that teachers were selling this year. And we had over 300 um, attendees. And so I just wanted to thank our former board chair, Amy Scott Stoltz, you can stand. <laughs> and Avera Health um, for sponsoring this event. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker this morning, Dr. Brian Maher. Um, he has led the district through an extensive strategic planning process, and he is going to share some of the priorities for this next upcoming year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for being here. I want to uh, begin my remarks this morning by saying, Nathan and Jason, where did you go? Oh, boy, stay close, because if I bomb, I want that drone flying around. I want, I want Fred walking around. I want a distraction. So you're both on call here. Um, I want to start with some thank yous here this morning. First of all, thanks to the foundation for all that you do. Um, it, for those of you who are paying attention, 
you probably see that there's some momentum in the foundation. And I can tell you from the seat that I sit in, I really appreciate what you're doing. It, it, as Stephanie said earlier, there's no executive director. There isn't anybody on a daily basis taking care of the day-to-day -day activities to move this foundation forward. It's just good people from the community, from your community, working to do good things for the public schools. So to all of the foundation members, thanks so much for what you do. And I would say that this group today really is reflective of, of your efforts. I think uh, two years ago, when I, when I first addressed this group, it was probably about half of this size. I don't know for sure. Last year, it got a little bit bigger. And this year, I think it's even bigger yet. So hopefully, uh, before long, we're at the arena. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but it continues to grow. And, and to me, that is, that is so much a reflection of what's going on in the foundation. So for those of you involved in the foundation, thank you for your efforts. Uh, the second thing I would say is thanks to all of you for being here as I, as I look out. Uh, certainly I see the world of education represented to a great deal. Um, I see former administrators, former teachers. I see current administrators and current teachers. And by the way, to the current administrators and current teachers, I apologize in advance because what you'll see today will be largely what you'll see at the Pentagon um, here soon. So. Um, that doesn't mean you can skip that meeting. You'll, you'll still have to come to that meeting. But there's going to be some redundancy for you there. So uh, thanks to, and then as I look to the cross section of the community here, from the mayor and a uh, very uh, broad array of business and industry here, thanks so much for being here today and, and for your support of the school system. And then my, my final thank you goes out to the number of teachers who are here. Our, our lifeblood, many people have heard me say in, in my time here, but we don't have one employment category that's more important than another. Everybody has their role to do to make our school system work. So I'm not singling teachers out because they're more important or less important than any other employment category, but they are indeed our backbone. They're in, they're in the classroom with teachers every day, and they are the backbone of what we do as an educational industry. So to all of the teachers here, Thank you so much for what you do, and I hope you're rested and recharged and ready to go because it's about time to start up again. So to the teachers, thanks for being here today. My final thank you goes to Deanne. Deanne, thanks so much for being a, a liaison, a conduit between the foundation and the school district and getting <coughs> so much done, but also today for being my assistant in terms of uh, Getting, getting things going here with the PowerPoint and for producing the PowerPoint. So thanks so much to Deanne. So to all of you, thank you for your roles here today. So let's talk about the, the vision. Where are, we, where are we headed? I can tell you that um, through a lot of work from folks from all across the district and uh, with the direct support of the Board of Education, um, and by the way, we have two members of our board here. We have Kent Alberti and Carly Ryder both here. Uh, the, we have three other members of our board who are unable to make it today. Uh, Todd Tolke, Cynthia Mickelson, and Kate Parker were, were in, unable to be here. But uh, those five folks are very instrumental in not only uh, having a strategic plan, but making sure that it gets implemented with, with fidelity. But what we've done is we've put together a district vision. You hear that all the time. What, what's your vision? What do you see? What do you plan? Um, and really, that's the strategic plan. It's, it's not any more or any less sexy than that. It's a set of goals. This is what we're hoping to accomplish. In fact, what I challenged our administrators to do this week is strike that hoping to accomplish, and let's commit to accomplish the goals that you're going to see in front of us today. So what are, what are we looking at? What's our vision? Our vision incorporates uh, improvements in the graduation rate, improvement improvement in our attendance rate, um, getting better at handling and teaching appropriate behaviors in our schools, um, working on our staff demographics, working on student achievement, working on the engagement not only of our, of our students but of our staff because we want to be a dynamic workforce as, as well as a great place for kids to learn, and then a, a conversation that I'll have with you somewhat in depth about facilities. So I'll talk a little bit about each one of those today and, and hopefully give you a glimpse at least of what our vision is for the school district. 
Let's talk first about the graduation rate. Anybody who has heard me speak in the last two years has heard me speak about the graduation rate and how we need to take steps to reverse a troubling trend. And that trend was our graduation rate was going down. And last year, it reached a low of 80.55%. So if you think about that, 20 out of every 100 kids who come into our schools leave without a diploma. Unacceptable. Um, and I didn't talk to anybody in the community, anybody in the school district who didn't think that that was unacceptable. We talked to several people who said, but what can we do? Um, and I can tell you what we've done really is we've taken an individual look at who's not graduating and we've tried to get them to the finish line as I call it, or graduation, at least uh, that's the finish line for K-12. Uh, it's, it's that individual approach that has our trend being reversed now and you see that arrow going slightly up. Uh, we don't get our, our official statistics back from the Department of Education until September 18th. But I do know that preliminarily we've gone up about 2% and it won't go down below that, it'll only go up from there. I would also tell you that 2%, um, 80, 82, it's actually 82.51 is our preliminary data. 82.51 is still unacceptable, but we've reversed the trend, I believe. And I believe next year I'll be able to put a little, put a little greater angle on that trend line. I think we're doing things right because we have a lot of people emphasizing graduation as being critical to, to what we do. So we're very happy with that graduation rate uh, in terms of growth, not in terms of a final destination yet. But we're, we're pleased at the direction. The next thing that I wanted to talk about is attendance. Well, part, of our, part of our issue with graduation is it's hard to teach kids that won't come to school. So how do we make sure that we engage kids how do we make sure we improve our attendance rate? And there were two things that we did last year that I thought were really phenomenal. We put a lot of energy into getting kids to school. Um, one of the things we did were we were tremendous cheerleaders last year. I think that started, started all the way at the governor's office, quite frankly. Governor Dugard put out last year a real emphasis on attendance statewide. We were tickled to see that in the district because that was an emphasis for us. I know Mayor Huther emphasized that from the city offices, and we certainly did in the school district as well. So we were tremendous cheerleaders in, in, uh, in trying to get kids and families to see the importance of attending school. We also incentivized attendance. We gave away a whole lot of coupons and certificates. Some of you were probably hit up in the community to help us with that. Um, we, gave, we gave a lot of things away to kids including bicycles in some of our schools to a couple of students for, uh, for improved attendance. I can tell you we're not where we need to be yet on that. Cheerleading alone is not enough. And incentivizing, while it seems like it would work really well, doesn't appear to work that well. So we're going to try to figure out what else can we do. In some areas, our attendance uh, was flatlined. But as of yesterday, we actually dug into some data that showed we're making some progress in that area. That progress is incremental, and I think it's really going to take some time to move the needle on attendance, but we're moving it, and, and we won't stop. Uh, we, we will not stop uh, on, on this particular area. Uh, a year ago, in, in June, I asked the principals as they were gathered, if we could correct one thing in the district, what would it be? And you think of graduation rates and student achievement, all of those things to impact. And the one thing they said we could, if, if we could fix, was attendance. If we could have fixed, we should, and it's attendance. Because if, if we can improve attendance, we think we can improve a whole lot of the other areas that we're talking about. So next steps, we'll get creative, and I love the word innovative that I've seen around here from the Education Foundation. We'll get innovative on, on how we try to, to uh, address that issue. Another, another uh, part of the vision is behaviors. When I think of the behaviors in the school district, in, in, in schools everywhere, but certainly the schools in, in the Sioux Falls, I see a troubling trend on inappropriate behaviors. I don't think we're unique as a city to that, but I do think it's something that we need to address. I tell people when I speak to them about behaviors, because it, it generally follows a question, are kids changing? Maybe a little bit, society is changing, so I suppose we're changing, and suppose kids are changing a little bit. Uh, 
are, are the schools becoming a tougher place to be? In some regards, I think yes. Um, but, but here's what I know. We are reflective of what's happening in our community. And as our community grows and is so vibrant, and you can feel the economic vibrancy in the community, all the good things that are going on in the community, there's also some things that we're not excited about. Those, generally speaking, are behaviors, they're mental health related, they're drug related, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got those issues in our public schools. We are a reflection of what's going on in our community, both from the positive side, and there's plenty to speak about there, but also from the poor side, and that's poor behaviors. So we've got to continue to address the poor behavior issue in our schools. We're not where we need to be on that, on that front, and we've got a long way to go on that area. We, we're, uh, we're trying to do a lot of different things in terms of, of uh, behaviors. I'll give you one example. Tier two, tier two classrooms are something that were started a few years ago and something that have been expanded over the last couple of years. And for those of you who aren't in our schools, I'll, give, I'll try to give you a, a, a visual of what a tier two classroom is. If you think of uh, back in the day when you were in the, in the classroom as a student and somebody acted up, they might get sent out of the classroom and sent either down to the principal's office or to an in-school suspension room or somewhere where essentially what we did was we warehoused kids. Just get out of my room and go somewhere else. And eventually those kids would come back. Well, the tier two takes that to the next level. And what we do in our tier two rooms is really try to teach appropriate behaviors. I call it restorative justice. It's not simply a punitive measure where you acted poorly, get out. When you know how to act, you can come back. How do we know that they now know how to act appropriately if we don't teach them? So a tier two room is simply an extension of that teaching and learning process. It's not perfect yet, but it's a great next step. And it's focused on really meeting the needs of students. And that's what we're really trying to do <coughs> to accomplish this, this uh, complicated task of improving inappropriate behaviors. And I would tell you that the last item on this particular issue is this. It's unfinished business. We're not where we want to be. I don't want to over-exaggerate the problem, but I also don't want to pretend that there's not a problem. We have unfinished business in this area. The next topic that I want to talk about are staff demographics. And I believe that to talk about staff demographics, I need to start by talking about student demographics. And when I talk about our student demographics, I looked back just one generation in the 91-92 school year, so 26 years ago now, I had 25 on there uh, because I didn't ask Fred how to subtract. <laughs> 20, 26 years ago, uh, we, we had in our school district, 94% of our students were white, 6% of our students were non-white. Today, about 65% of our students are white, and about 35% of our students are non-white. And when I look, when I look at, that, at, at those facts, I look a little bit further, and there was, a, there was an article in the Argus Leader, I think in April, that talked about the diversity community-wide. And if I remember that statistic, uh, it, it said that 82% of the Sioux Falls community was white, which means 18% of our community is non-white. And I thought, how could that be? 82% versus our 65%, that doesn't seem right. And then I looked at our statistics, and I look at our elementary schools, and in our elementary schools, we're 63% white and 37% non-white. So as I look at all of those data points, what I see is diversity that's growing. So this isn't a bubble of diversity that we have, it's our new reality as a city, it's our new reality as a, as a school district. <laughs> And we can talk about embracing diversity, and I think we should talk about it, but our actions need to show more than, than just talk. So embracing diversity, now I'll go back one generation and look at our staff demographic. Our staff demographic one generation ago was 98% white and 2% non-white. And after that one generation of change, our staff diversity is 98% white and 2% non-white. I didn't mix up my statistics there. It hasn't, it hasn't changed. But also our adult population hasn't changed much yet. So our, our pipeline of being able to, to attract and retain the best and brightest teachers regardless of race, gender, or ethnicity, um, it hasn't changed much. So we're doing everything we can right now 
to improve that pipeline to not only have the quality of teacher that we have today, uh, but also to have a more diverse workforce so that our diversity in our workforce begins to look and approximate more like the student population that we have. I'm not looking at any quotas, and I know sometimes this is an uncomfortable conversation, but I think it's silly if we don't look to address the staff demographic issue as a, as a school district. Student achievement. It's all about what we do. You, you notice that my PowerPoints have very few words on them except for this one quote right here because I think this quote is critical and I didn't want to paraphrase and get it wrong. Third grade reading achievement is, critical mar is a critical marker for success in our schools. We can talk about graduation rate, we can talk about attendance, I contend we can talk about behaviors, but this third grade reading mark is if I could only pick one, I would pick this one to change immediately. And here's why. There was a study conducted by the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and that study found that a student who cannot read on grade level by third grade is four times less likely to graduate high school on time than a child who does read proficiently by that time. If he or she lives in poverty, they are 13 times less likely to graduate on time compared to his or her proficient, wealthier peer. So it's critical that we hit that we hit that third grade marker, that we have kids reading at grade level by third grade. I contend that we also need them to be at grade level mathematically by third grade. And I believe if those two things could happen, a whole lot of other issues could, could, uh, could be solved. It, it's complicated. We're addressing it. We started, uh, we, we have a number of summer programs. But two years ago, we started a program called Summer Climb. Um, we're seeing good results there. We'll continue to see, to do program evaluation to see if those results uh, are sustainable. Um, but we're looking at a number of different areas in this particular, uh, in this particular event that we need to change. Engagement. Everything you've seen so far is about kids, and rightfully so. That's why we have jobs. That's why we do what we do. But sometimes it's easy to forget that uh, the Sioux Falls School District is also a workplace for adults. As a matter of fact, it's a workplace for about 3,300 adults. And in our city, we're the fourth largest employer behind Sanford, Avera, and John Morrell. Then it comes to the Sioux Falls School District. So we have a lot of people making their livelihood. We're really an economic driver when you think of it that way in the community. So it, it's very important that we have an engaging place to work. We're really tickled. Uh, we we uh, take the uh, Gallup engagement survey. We're really tickled to see last year we ticked up quite a little bit in engagement of our staff. That's our entire staff, every employment category. We hope to continue to see that raise and raise and raise. So all of you in business and industry, I know in, on some levels, we're all competing for those same workers. And we know some of you have incredibly engaging workplaces. We want to be like you or better than you so that you don't steal our staff, so that maybe we can steal some of yours in a very polite way. Facilities, and, and this issue I think you'll probably begin to hear a lot about in the school district. Here's a, here's a, a, a piece of uh, information pulled directly out from our strategic plan. And it says that we want to engage the community in dialogue about enrollment trends and their potential impact on facilities. And I would say if I could rewrite that today, I would say I would strike potential and just say on their impact on facilities because our enrollment trends are having a tremendous impact on our facilities. Let me talk to you a little bit about that. I'm going to go through five different slides that, that develop the multiple layers that we're talking about here. What level are we talking about? Are we talking about middle level, high school level, elementary level? I'm going to talk to you about an event that happened in 1923, a little philosophical conversation, which is always fun. I'm going to talk about some input that we need to gather, and then I'm going to talk about the significance from the school district perspective of 1997. So let's start with what level. I get that question last year we talked about the high school and the, the enrollment at our high schools uh, and I, I get get the uh, the question usually a comment and a question when I would speak to civic groups and the first comment was oh my gosh you need a new high school 
And then that was followed by a question, where are you going to build the new high school? And I wish the conversation was that simple, but the fact of the matter is it's a little more complicated than that. Let me start with the 1100 story here. If I, could, if I could count the number of seats that we have for students in high school, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, and I include the seats that we have available at Washington High School, at Roosevelt High School, at Lincoln High School, at New Tech High School, at Joel Foss, at CTE Academy, at the President's Academy, all of those seats that we have available for high school students, if I counted those up and made that number X, just hold on to that for a second. That's the number of seats. We, we can calculate that, right? We know that number. We have X number of seats available for our high school students in the Sioux Falls School District. And I would compare that number to our first four grades, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade from this recently completed um, school year. If I would compare our first four grades to our last four grades, remember our last four grades, that's X, our first four grades is X plus 1,100. So if we had our, our first four grades today, if they were in high school, we would be 1,100 seats short for those students. So what do we do about that? Well, luckily, we don't have to decide today, but I think we need to begin deciding today how are we going to accommodate that growth in our school system. Uh, the, the second, the second the bullet point there, that's Roosevelt High School, Washington High School, Lincoln High School, Rapid City Central, Rapid City Stevens. Those are the five largest school buildings in the state of South Dakota. The five largest. Our three, high, our three comprehensive high schools and the two comprehensive high schools in Rapid City. For those of you that know, please don't answer, but do you have any idea what the sixth largest school in the state of South Dakota is? Memorial Middle School. You might think Aberdeen Central, you might think Watertown, you might think Brandon Valley, you might think Harrisburg. No, Memorial Middle School is bigger than any other high school other than the public high schools in Sioux Falls or in Rapid City. And remember, Memorial Middle School, we still only allow them to have three grades there. The high schools have four grades. I thought that was going to be funnier than it is. <laughs> High schools have four grades. Memorial Middle School has three grades, over 1,300 students in that building. A fantastic facility, and parents are not knocking on my door saying, will you please get my child out of Memorial Middle School? That's not the issue. But the issue is we're growing in enrollment. So when I look at what level, certainly at the high school level, we have an enrollment issue. Definitely at the middle level, we have an enrollment issue. But that 900 number, 900, that's the number of students that we have at Discovery Elementary and nearly the number of students we have in Pettigrew Elementary. 900 students is a very large elementary school. So the question is, how big is too big at the elementary level? And I would say that we have multiple elementary schools that have a lot of students in them based on the brick and mortar that they have. And so we have to look at what's the enrollment doing at our elementary level. So what level? The, the honest answer to that is every level we've got enrollment issues. So is enrollment our only, our only question? You like that? Did you see how we have that work? <laughs> we've, also, we've also got uh, uh, facilities that, we're, that uh, we've got to think about. 1923, the reason that that was on the original slide is that was the year that, that uh, Whittier Middle School was inhabited. So not quite 100 years old, but we can see it from where we are. It's a, it's a building that's been around a long time. And I put up there that it's seasoned rather than old, because I think old implies that uh, it's past its usefulness, and I don't think that's true. It's not unsafe, it's, it's not crumbling. In fact, if it was, it would probably be an easier conversation for us to have. It's a bit of a tank, quite frankly. So there's some useful life left in Whittier. My question is, as I look at the next two statistics, the 18, the 18 is the number of levels in Whittier Middle School. That doesn't mean stories, that just means levels. So I might go up two steps from this level to that level, I might go up three steps here, I might go down a couple steps over there. 18 different levels in that building. And that, re and that uh, brings on all sorts of logistical issues. Chief among those are ADA issues that we have. 
So my question is, do, how, how long does that tank continue to serve us? 12 is the number of additions that we've put onto Whittier since 1923. And really my, my, biggest, my biggest issue here is to say, not only do we have enrollment issues as we look at our facilities, but we also have some tender loving care issues. What do we do with Whittier specifically, but also other buildings that, uh, that need some tender loving care as we go forward, part of that comprehensive facilities look. And I would always be careful before I would ever say, and I don't want you to think that I'm saying, we've gotta get rid of Whittier. That's not what I'm saying. But I think we do have to look at Whittier and many other buildings in the school district as to what their, uh, what their usefulness is going forward for the school district. Next, I talked about philosophy, and I'll make this pretty quick because this, I think, could get really complicated. But as, when we talk about philosophy in conjunction with our facilities conversation, two primary areas that I think we should focus on, one is on school boundaries, and two is on school size. You've heard me address that a little bit. On boundaries, here's my point there. The issue of boundaries, as, it, 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 as our board knows, they are charged with being good stewards of, of all resources that the community gives us to work with. Part of those resources are the facilities that we inhabit. And we've got to make sure that not only do we keep those facilities looking good and functioning at a high level, we've also got to make sure that we're using them to their fullest capacity. If we've got a building over here with 1,500 students in it and a building over here with 500 students in it, we probably ought to figure out how we use those resources to the best that we can use them. So boundaries is certainly an issue that, uh, that we've got to take on over the next year. And then school size, the other issue. How big is too big uh, in, in terms of uh, the number of students we want in our, in our schools? So input. I would tell you as we look at these facilities issues, these aren't decisions that a superintendent gets to make, and these aren't decisions that a board gets to make in a vacuum. Some of you may have followed this, uh, this last spring, uh, we chose to do an opt-out, and there was some controversy on that opt-out, and part of that controversy was you didn't give the community enough input on that. And you know what, as I reflect on that criticism, I think you're right. I really do, and I think I could have done more to, to eliminate some of that criticism. I wanna make sure that we're not criticized a year from now on lack of input. So what we're doing is really trying to put together a means for input from our students, from our staff, from our community, and from our parents. And if you're wondering, aren't our parents part of our community? The answer is certainly yes. They're a pretty captive audience. We can usually get pretty good feedback from our parents, we want to make sure that we're also getting good feedback from those people who no longer have students in our schools and from those people who don't yet have students in our schools. We've got to make sure that we engage our community on just what we should do. So that brings us to really a, a whole timeline on how, how are you going to accomplish all of those things as you move forward. I would tell you that we've, we've had a conversation at a board retreat here just a few weeks ago about specific steps to take month by month over the next year. And those steps include really kind of, August is really just figuring out where we are. We have facilities issues today um, that we need to take care of. So how are we going to do that? In September, we're going to talk about what's the vision look like for the future? How many drones are we going to have flying around in our buildings? How many, how many little Freds are we going to have walking around in our buildings? And as you saw during Nathan's, during Nathan's presentation, I thought it was so appropriate. Um, how much of what he showed us took place in a typical classroom? Very little. So that, that part of education has changed significantly, and I think it continues to change. Does it change what we need from a brick and mortar standpoint going forward? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's something we've got to dig into deeply. October, we'll have our enrollment. We'll know our enrollment for sure. We'll also be able to project out another year. And when we talk about enrollment, I think there are a couple of things that we need to get clear on. One is, I've heard people talk about this bubble of new students that we have, and I'm not sure we have a bubble. I think we have a trend. I think we have a change in our, in our enrollment. Um, but, in, but in October, we'll have another year's worth of data to help try to assess that situation. In November, we'll put all this information together 
and, and most of, most all of this will be done by district employees and will be shared publicly in, at a board meeting actually at a board retreat in December with the Board of Education so that's the that's the plan before we flip the calendar to 2018 and in 2018 at that point I think we will need to bring in somebody from the outside to help us have a community conversation and help us with that planning uh, from a master master facilities planning perspective to help us with what are all of our options what are all of our costing and then right after that in February and March we have at least today what we've termed a facilities for the future committee this is a community this is a community committee a cross-section of I'll say today about 25 people I don't know if that's 20 or 40 or what the appropriate number is but it, it's got to be big enough to be representative of our community and it's got to be small enough to where we can still get work done to look at all the options available to us to talk through some of the philosophical positions that I mentioned earlier and then figure out where do we where do we go from there and help take all of these options that we have for facilities and narrow it down to three or four or five options or whatever the magic number is and then take those options out to the community in April and May and in June and let our community really weigh in on what our what our options are in terms of improving our facilities from the school district standpoint by then in July I think our board will have the opportunity to determine a, a scope of what a project might look like going forward uh, that's a lot of heavy lifting in one year it may be overly ambitious but that's the goal today that's the vision today in terms of addressing our facilities so 1997 the last bullet point that I had on that slide so many slides ago 1997 was the last year that we did a major bond issue from a school district perspective um, that was that was the last year and that bond issue did a lot of things chief among those things was providing equity uh, uh, from building to building across our district and hopefully that's not something we lose sight of as we move forward but that's the last time 20 years ago that, that, that we ran a bond issue so going forward that's that wasn't a that was on purpose that I made that very small <laughs> do we run a bond issue is that something we be we begin to talk about I can tell you from a facility standpoint I don't believe uh, I believe the scope of work that's going to be required for us to continue and move forward will be much larger and I support you on the bond issue <laughs> <laughs> we got one vote <laughs> I support it. we've got uh, but uh, so back to my that back to my thought pattern. <laughs> so that that bond issue, which I think we'll most likely have to have, is something that I don't get to decide, and we're a long way away from deciding. But I think it's in the offing. I think that's something that, uh, that we'll ramp up conversations about as this year goes by. So with that, I would tell you that this picture the Ann found and, it's, and, and the picture and the font sizes are up there on purpose. We're part of the ecosystem. The Sioux Falls School District is part of the ecosystem of this wonderful city. This, when, we, when I think of this community, and I think about it on a large scale, I don't want to say our piece is insignificant because I don't believe that, but I believe we're just, I believe we're just part of a larger e ecosystem that is the Sioux Falls community. And that's what the, the, the context this conversation has to take place in. So we're, we're happy to be part of that ecosystem as well. And finally, I think of why do we do what we do? Well, certainly it's, it's because of kids. But when I think of all of those vision pieces, when I think of demographics, when I think of achievement, when I think of attendance, when I think of moving that metric, and I'll use graduation as the, as the example here. I'm so happy to be able to tell you today that our graduation rate is, is, is rebounding and moving more in a positive trend. I can't wait to talk to civic groups about that. I can't wait to thump our chest and say, look at us when it comes to graduation rate. But I can tell you that the only way that needle moves is if we make a difference for kids. And people find that to be a trite saying sometimes, that's for the kids, but it really is. 
And let me tell you what a 2% increase in graduation means. If our graduation rate would have stayed the same last year to this year, 32 kids who have a diploma today wouldn't have had a diploma. That's what that means. It means 32 kids have a diploma, a Sioux Falls School District diploma. That's why we want to continue to emphasize that. It truly is about kids. And what we're about in the Sioux Falls School District is incredibly meaningful work. It's about human development. That's what we're in the business of. Teaching and learning, yep, yep, all those things. Human development, that's what we're in the business of. We're so happy today that all of you uh, gave of your time and talent to be here with us and help us on that quest to develop those young human lives in our community. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being part of the solution. Thank you, Dr. Maher. We appreciate your leadership and vision in our board members here, too, for the tough decisions that are ahead. We're transitioning the program just a little bit now to talk about what we as a community can do. I'm Vernon Brown from SDN Communications, and we're one of the supporters of the Education Foundation. And I'm here to introduce my former colleague, Jay Hoisiga, who is, uh, leads Kello TV. Uh, so we worked together back in the day. And so sometimes I darken Jay's doorstep asking for help on good community projects. You might notice he holds onto his wallet tightly whenever I get near him now. <laughs> Uh, but to Jay's credit, I, I don't think he's ever told me no, because I only bring the good opportunities to him. And Jay has become sort of an evangelist for our organization. Last year, Kello TV uh, honored the Education Foundation by doing uh, PSAs, uh, the Kello Land Cares PSAs, Public Service Announcements, about the organization and what our mission is. That afforded us more name recognition than we could ever afford to buy. And our purpose is really to drive any money we bring in to the grants. And so Jay is here to talk about why as a business person, as a business leader in the community, uh, he invests in public education. So please welcome my friend Jay Hoisinger. Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity and uh, to have a few minutes to speak to you today. Before I get started, um, I want to thank Dr. Maher for his leadership. I've seen him speak a, a number of times through com through community events, and uh, we have the right leader with the right vision. And I don't think we could be luckier as a community to have a leader like Dr. Maher taking us through the future. So, thank you very much. For So I already lost the mayor. Hopefully the rest of you will uh, stay just for a few minutes. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint, so you're lucky for that. Uh, about uh, 10 years ago, I think, I was having lunch with Steve Herman, who's sitting at the table. and He was telling me about this organization, the Sioux Falls uh, Education uh, Foundation. And I was like, oh, that's very interesting. And yeah, we give grants, and we help teachers out, and I'm like, why does the school district help the teachers out? And you know the usual questions you'd get when you first heard of something like this. So we had conversations over a few years, and then my good friend Vernon Brown darkened my door, as he said, and uh, started talking to me in a little more earnest fashion about that. And when Steve Herman and Vernon Brown team double team on you, you're eventually going to give them money. So I can tell you uh, if, they, if they show up together. So, so. When I was talking to Vernon about it, we got a little bit more serious about what the needs were for the foundation. And so we became a donor, and we've been a donor for, I can't tell you how many years, I, I don't keep track of that type of thing, but uh, we became a donor, and you know the best thing about being a donor, besides giving the money, is seeing where the money goes. So each spring, I've been invited to help Vernon go to a school and give away a check, and the last spring when I was able to do that, I had Jason. Uh, I gave Jason the check for, what's his name, Fred? You can call him Jay, too. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I can push that with my yeah, well, yeah, let's have a vote or something. So but anyway, I had the opportunity to uh, have him uh, take that check. And just listening to his enthusiasm, he didn't even have, have it yet. And listening to the enthusiasm that he had was really quite amazing. So 
and as I was looking at the slide when the two gentlemen were up there and they were showing the grants and the pictures, it was a picture of that check proposal. And I kept looking at that going, what's my dad doing up there? I couldn't believe it. It was like, wow. And then I realized that that was me from last spring. So <laughs> it, it, was, it was a great experience. And I told the teachers this at the time. And I really, truly believe this. And I'm going to disagree with Dr. Maher on one thing. Teachers are the most important employee that we have. They're more important than any employee I have. I can tell you that. I believe in public education. I believe in it because I was a product of public education. But what we do in, to take our children and give them off to teachers who are so dedicated and then sometimes have to spend their own money to educate our children is something, a profession that I don't think there's a higher calling. And I truly believe that about all of our teachers. So I have a personal uh, interest in this. My granddaughter, Emmy, is going to start in kindergarten at Sonia Sotomayor in just a few weeks. So I'm very excited about that. And she's very excited. She's already been through the school and met some of the teachers and knows where the lunchroom is and all that type of thing. And she couldn't be more thrilled and excited about that opportunity. Her brother, who's two years behind her, is going to follow her there, and we're really, really excited about that whole opportunity. So I'm here to tell you that as a, a corporate donor at Kello, not only do we give money, but as Vernon said, we gave a grant through our Tradition of Caring grant. And what that really does is tries to get the information out on, on necessary uh, uh, nonprofits within the community. And so we do it statewide, but we really have a, an affinity for the Sioux Falls Education Foundation in that particular uh, venue. So we're going to be doing that again this year. Uh, applications are in October, but uh, I think I can get that one through. I have a little general manager's privilege, so I think the Education Foundation probably is in good shape from that, from that standpoint. So we want to do that. We also want to give money, but I can tell you because of the importance of what we do and what the teachers do in this community. If you're not giving to the Education Foundation at this time, I really encourage you to do so. And if you are, I encourage you to increase that. There, this organization does it a lot to help teachers. Teachers do a lot to help our students and our children are our most important asset. So I thank you for the time. I thank you for listening to me. And if there's anything I can do to help the Education Foundation, they certainly know where to find me. It's been a great thrill and a great honor to be part of the organization. Thank you. So that's how your businesses can give, but also we can do things personally ourselves. And, and you'll find materials on the tabletop there that that uh, you, envelopes that you can write in what you'd like to give. But I also encourage you, we are seeing some success in, in estates remembering uh, the foundation. One quick story, uh, a friend and neighbor of mine, Beth Boyens, when her mother died, there they decided that their estate, her mother's estate, would leave something for the foundation as well. I had the privilege of going uh, to an elementary school where she got to present a check in memory of her mother. There was, her mother was a, a reading teacher in the Sioux Falls School District for many years. There was nothing more touching than watching her have her mother live through that program that she was gifting uh, in the school district. So I encourage you to think about those possibilities as well. We appreciate your time today and we appreciate your consideration. Thank you and thank you for helping us get momentum in this organization. We really appreciate that.